Well, now you know me by reputation. As I always say, that's my best side. <laughs> okay, so um, I have 20 minutes. I just turned on my countdown clock on my phone, so I will end at 20 minutes. Um, just, uh, I'm not going to tell you about myself, but uh, I do want to say that you know I really appreciate all of you being here, taking the time. We're professionals. We're all busy. Our heads are swimming all the time with all sorts of stuff. We make lists. We keep track. We get pinged by our phone. So what can I do today? Uh, I just want to share a little bit about my recent personal journey and my theme scripture. Come on. And hopefully you'll take that uh, take that with you. So my my favorite acronym is this. Does anybody know what this means? What does it mean, Jim McCartney? What's going on here? What is going on here? So, you know, work is complicated. We're all professionals. Our lives, as I said, we have a lot going on. And I think many times the thing we miss is the big picture. We get buried in the details. We get buried in deadlines. And sometimes you've got to just step back and go, hey, what is going on here? You know, in my life, I'm 57. Uh, I've had three careers, um, and you know, it is what it is. But it occurred to me one day, you know, I'm probably, it's probably near the end of the third quarter in my life. You know, I, I was going to do like, how old are you and stuff, it doesn't matter, okay, whatever. But um, I thought I need to do a little we go on my life. You know, because I don't want to just be opportunistic. The way I've lived my life, it's funny, I, I read a book by Steve Farrar, he's a Christian men's author. And uh, he was friends with Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey has a seven-page personal mission statement. Wow. Farrar said, I heard that, I needed a nap after that. <laughs> Steve Farrar said, I thought about it for a long time. My personal mission statement is three words. Don't mess up. <laughs> and I thought, you can't have that. That's mine. <laughs> and so I've lived my life that way. You know, I, I went to MIT, right? Next door here for grad. You know why I went to MIT? Because I wanted to move to Boston. All the companies I interviewed with in Boston rejected me. The only way I could get to Boston was through the door of MIT. That's why I went. I had no ambition. No, I just wanted to, you know, do whatever God wanted me to do. And I think that's the way a, a lot of us are. You live your life that way, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. You know, but I thought, I need a little more of a strategy. I want to be more strategic than opportunistic for the last quarter of my life. And so I, I started talking to people that I respect. Roger Lamb, you know, Roger's really old, so he's really helpful with these kinds of issues. And um, Roger had a lot to say, but, but he wasn't the one who gave me my theme scripture. Jeff Todd, who's doing the AV today, we're at Boston Market in Lawrence, Mass. And he said, let me show you a scripture. So I'm going to read this to you. This is my theme scripture. Numbers 8, 23 through 26. The Lord said to Moses, this applies to the Levites. Men 25 years old or more shall come to take part in the work at the tent of meeting. But at the age of 50, they must retire from their regular service and work no longer. They may assist their brothers in performing their duties at the tent of meeting, but they themselves must not do the work. This then is how you are to assign the responsibilities of the Levites. This is a, everybody always does this. Whenever I talk, they all laugh. But there's a lot here. This is a we go scripture for me. You know, I think, oh, I'm entering my fourth quarter. You know, I'm gonna be dead soon or whatever. But you know what? You know what this scripture tells me? It's not all about me. It's a relay race. I'm entering my fourth quarter, but somebody else is entering their first quarter. Right, right. And if I'm stuck on myself, I'm going to miss what God has called me to in my life. Those who are retired, you know, we need a theology of retirement in our fellowship. And it's not when you can't stand up anymore or where you wander off. It's where you change how you view your service to God. That's what retirement is. And uh, those who are retired, they can help their younger brothers and sisters do the work, but they must not take over. You've got to think about that for a while. So this means in the church, older and younger work together, not against each other. You know, so often in the church, sort of the, you know, the, the uh, prototypical old person, you got their arms crossed, I don't, like, I don't like the singing, it's too loud. There's this whole negative thing going on, right? And the young people are like, look at them, you know, they don't even show up. And 
We don't want to be like that. We're on the same team. We have the same goal. We just have a different role. I don't want our church to be an old people's church. At the same time, we want older disciples to be respected and included. You know, have you ever noticed younger people tend to be more idealistic and aggressive? Let's blow it up. You know, we have, we have, I'm going to talk about this. I work with a lot of younger people now, by choice. And it's so funny, you know, like John Norton, he's one of my young Levites. Uh, John is like, you know, we just need to do this and that, and it's not good enough. And, you know, that's good. That's good for us to hear that. Yeah. Younger people tend to be more aggressive. They need the wisdom, patience, and experience of older leaders to help them make wise decisions. Amen. But, you know, Boston in the early days, Frank Kim led a region at age 22. I was appointed evangelist at age 25. You say, wow, you were a finished product then? I'm not a finished product now. I'm worse now than I was then. But the point is we need a lot of coaching. Young people need to be first string in the church, not the subs, not the backups. After we had our teen service about three months ago, I went to every person who spoke. I said, I know what you think. You think all these old people, they know so much more than you. You know, maybe someday you'll be able to like be an assistant junior part-time blah, blah. <laughs> You are the starter. If you need any backup, I'm here for you. And I'm not, I'm, by the way, who am I? I'm just like Jim Blau. I don't have a role. But, but the point is, the young people need to be leading. So I decided my new theme is help your brothers. That's my theme in my life, help your brothers. It's great to know what you're supposed to do. It's great to know what is going on here. Two years ago, we hired two new guys in my job. One of them is John Norton. John is a master's in accounting, CPA, young knucklehead. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> He's also related to Doug Arthur, but we don't hold that against him. <laughs> and then Toby Koha, who's Valder's son, who's an attorney. We're looking for another accountant, looking for another attorney. So these guys joined our, our team. The most significant thing I've done in the last two years of my life is train John Norton. The most significant thing I've done. John's a disciple, but John is like me. We have a lot in common. You know, because I thought, if I get 10 years down the road and I just sit and work all the time, what's that going to look like? No one is going to know anything more about what I do except me. What a waste. So now John knows everything. Not only that, John does real work. So our company in the last 20 years, we've done almost $10 billion in real estate transactions in our little company in Nashville, New Hampshire. Right now, we're, we're raising $45 million for a, an acquisition of an energy company. The person who communicates with all the investors is John Norton. People sent people wiring money, five, seven, ten million bucks. John, they deal with John. One of the guys got confused about you know, his numbers, and John straightened him out. And he's, you know, this guy lives in Weston, Mass. He's a, probably a billionaire. He's like, hey, John, thanks for the help. That's real work. John's not just like steering for 30 seconds and then I take over. You know what I mean? And so it's been so exciting to me. Last fall, my, son, my older son, Jesse, who's never worked in finance before, he started working with me. He moved up from Texas. Then this spring, Kristen McDuffie, who's here somewhere, started working with EMS. Kristen is the most like me of any person I have ever met in my life. It's like scary. I mean, the same temperament, you know, just... Exactly. So, but you know, it's been, it's fabulous. So I was sick, I couldn't go to the EMS board meeting, but I got all this feedback. Hey, the young Levites, you know, they represented, it was awesome. So, you know, we all do this with our, with our families. You know, parents and grandparents support their children, even when they aren't perfect. Hey, jump, go for it, you can do it. We know this, we do this instinctively, but we need to do it in our work and in the church as well. Investing in the youth is the single greatest opportunity we have. You know, about two years ago, Mike Lamb, who leads our region, Mike is young, sort of. He's kind of a tweener. But um, he's, young, he's young for region leaders, okay, which is great. And um, so Mike said, we want to hire these two young couples to lead the youth and family ministry and to lead the campus. And so everybody needs to give a little bit more. And, you know, Don and I talked, and we thought, what else would we rather invest in than more young people to learn how to lead? And, you know, even the last two bonuses we got were like, what should we do? So we made, I don't know if you're supposed to tell people this, but we actually made targeted gifts. We wanted our tithe on our bonus to go to support those people. And I think they worked that out, although I don't know if we do that kind of giving in the church or not. But anyway, I think they figured it out. So here's the thing. 
So here's the thing. So you know the definition of an extroverted accountant, by the way? He looks at your shoes when he's talking to you rather than looking at his own shoes. <laughs> okay. So this is the thing. I want to spend my remaining years helping my younger brothers and sisters run the race. That's what I want to do. It's not about the age. It's not about stopping working. Right. You can stop working and still not be biblically retired. Right. Wow. Come on. And you can be biblically retired and not stop working. Right. It's about what your focus is on. Amen. I'm still going to work like a nuthead because that is what I do. Amen. Who said that? <laughs> but I'm not going to do it by myself any longer. Amen. I want more nutheads with me. Amen. Amen. And so I've introduced the concept. What do you think about my theme scripture? It's pretty cool. It's been fantastic for me. I have nine minutes left, so I just want to share four quick points from this passage. Number one, leadership is important, challenging, and valuable. We need to appreciate and encourage our leaders and aspire to become leaders ourselves. You know, this whole passage here in Numbers 8 is about who should lead God's people. There are very specific criteria given. You know, leadership is challenging. One of my favorite quotes from the American president with Michael Douglas and Annette Bening, when Michael Douglas and uh, Martin Sheen are playing pool, and Martin Sheen's criticizing him, and he goes, is the view pretty good from the cheap seats, AJ? You know, I've done a lot of things in my life. The hardest thing I've ever done is lead in the church. As my doctor once said, church people are nuts. Which is which is pretty true. No, it wasn't Milton. He would have put it more gently, but still made the point probably. Not only that, but our culture conspires to undermine, criticize, frustrate, and discredit leadership. You know why, I'm not gonna make too many political comments, but you know why we don't have any candidates running for president that anybody wants to vote for because we've chased them all away by being so negative and critical of leadership. So the only people who wanna lead are people that probably have some kind of ulterior motive. Let's not do that in the church. Let's not do that in our companies. Let's not do that in our families. Leadership is important. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, Hebrews 13, 7. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. I'm not talking about flattery. I'm not talking about putting people on a pedestal. I'm talking about genuine gratitude for doing a hard job well. And we, need, we all are professionals. We lead. We're in charge. We know how hard that is. We should be the most supportive and the most encouraging of the leaders that, that we come in contact with. At work, at church, in the family, in the community, in our nation. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up that point. Leadership matters. It's important. Done. Okay. Number two. <laughs> yeah, well, Doug, Doug just said, don't go over, so I'm not going to go over. So. <laughs> Number two, leadership should be passed on from generation to generation. Amen. Holding on too long or passing the torch too soon can both have serious consequences. Many of God's leaders were young. David, Jonathan, Josiah, Timothy, all of the apostles. I think God believes in young leadership. Would you say amen to that? Yeah. yeah, you're like, but yeah, you know, I know. I know, yeah, you know, but I know all that. But God believes in young leadership. And so we need to as well. First Timothy 4, 12, you know, Paul says, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example. We need to encourage our young people to lead, and then we need to follow them when they do. Oh. It's like, you know, the first time your kid drives or whatever. Oh. I find usually only one parent can teach the child to drive. Yes, there's usually only one of the two. Often the older generation holds on for too long and the younger generation doesn't see any meaningful opportunities for advancement. Because all the good jobs are all taken already. So they'll wander off somewhere else. Can't do anything in the church. Maybe I'll go there. Maybe I'll go. You know, when Glenn Petruzzi moved to Portland, all these young people were going to Portland because they were like, you know, we'll give you stuff to do. Okay, good. I'll, I'll go. You know, we need to make sure we don't hold on too long. On the other hand, 1 Kings 12, remember when Rehoboam became king? 
and there was a rebellion going on, and you know, his father had been tough on the rebels, but they thought, okay, the son's in, you know, let's, let's have a negotiation. And so he went to the elders, and they were like, you know, be, be kind to them, be gentle with them. And he went to all the young, his young friends, and they're like, blow them up, bomb them, blow them into oblivion. And so you know what? The divided kingdom of Israel happened because of one young guy who didn't listen to wise counsel from older people. So we all need to stay involved. Amen. So leadership needs to be passed. It needs to be passed at the right time in the right way. If you don't pass the torch, you know, remember the uh, U.S. relay team in the Olympics got disqualified? Oh, my God. Because they passed the, tor the, passed the baton outside of the transfer zone. That's right. You pass it too early, you're disqualified. You pass it too late, you're disqualified. But yeah. leadership needs to be passed on. Point number three. Each generation must take its turn and reach its own peers. God wants us to serve him in the prime years of our lives. You know, it's kind of an obvious point, but each generation was expected to provide its own Levites. There was no silent generation. You know, there's never been a U.S. president from the silent generation. It's true. We went straight from the greatest generation to the baby boomers. Generation skipping. It happens all the time in generational theory. It can't happen in God's kingdom. When you turn 25, you're starting. When you turn 50, you step aside and the next guy does it. Every, there's no generation skipping. Every generation needs to provide their own Levites. And when the young guys took over, they were expected to really lead, not just substitute or fill in for, for the older guys. The world is different today than it was 35 years ago. Anybody know Alan Albert, Alan and Sandy Albert? 35 years ago this month, Don and I met them in that dorm right there, doorknob. That was 35 years ago. The world's different now. I cannot tell the younger generation how to reach their peers. Only they can figure it out. You know, Philippians 2 talks about this. It says, uh, you know, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and then you can hold out the word of life. Every generation needs to sort of uh, define Christianity for its generation. The world is so different. We don't have nuclear families anymore. Homosexuality is, is widely accepted. People are distrustful of organizations. You know, when we were on campus, our appeal was, yeah, you think you're a Christian, but you're not a real Christian. And that was basically our, our talking point. And people were like, oh, you're right. You know, and then they would become a Christian. It wasn't any more complicated than that. Now people are like, what are you talking about? There's no God. See what I'm saying? So every generation needs to do it for themselves. The world has changed in so many ways. Even our country is going through a bit of a crisis. We, you, they need to figure out how to hold out the word of life in a meaningful way to this generation. Now let me be clear. The Bible is still the Bible, and the truth is still the truth. And the people said, Amen. But, what, that's right. But what resonates with people today will be different than what resonated with me. And that's why I gotta pass the torch. And they've gotta figure it out. And then point number four. Retirement isn't when we stop serving. It's when we cheer on the younger Levites, support them, and share our wisdom. You know, for most of us, I think, and we're professionals, but probably for most of us in here, retirement is still something we kind of dread. We're like, oh, I hope I can do it when it happens. And, you know, I mean, that, it shouldn't be that way. You know, if you live in the past and you think about how much better everything was in the olden days, retirement is discouraging. But if you're running a relay race, and you finish your lap, yes. and you hand that next person the baton, and you stand there and watch them. That's like the most exciting stage in your life. That's, right. That's what retirement is all about. That's what you're looking ahead. You're not looking back. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and for me, the last couple of years, it's been so exciting to share. You know, by the way, you think, oh, I, don't, I can't, like, get young people to work for me because I don't know anything. You think you don't know anything because you've never hired somebody that knows nothing. <laughs> Not, not, sorry, not that John and Kristen knew nothing, but, but you know, even, I mean, older women, T Titus 2, what does Titus 2 tell you you're supposed to share? Teach the younger. It's just life experience. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. But by sharing, you learn 
what God has taught you. I have 10 seconds left. If you want the full transcript of my notes, email me at jim.blau at gmail.com, 1959. Thank you. Good job.